I probably should have muted that so you couldn't hear the toilet flushing. I, I didn't know whose it was, so <laughs> <laughs> you just yeah. <laughs> there. You, <laughs> okay, so so star. There's there's your intro. <laughs> They're just three amigos making their way in the crazy old world of software as a service. Welcome to Founder Quest. Well, I, uh, that reminds me. I was gonna during our decision making thing. I was gonna. I was gonna say it would be a whole lot cooler though if we used a blockchain, like a decentralized. Since we're you know we're we're totally like a um, you know a remote first decentralized company. Like we should have a blockchain for our decision making process. So we also can have the audit trail. Yeah, to make sure the future is the future is now. Make sure that Star doesn't go back and change the decisions that we made. <laughs> what? Mm-hmm. <laughs> why? Why yeah. am I getting this flack? Well, because uh, you know, it, you know that I would be the one that would actually be doing that sort of thing. So that's why I had to say. Yeah, that. <laughs> we, it's more to protect against Ben. Yeah, exactly. it's, it's like it's a digital gavel. I'm I'm the totally random uh, element <laughs> in this in this outfit. That's for sure. Yeah, the the wild card. Yes, the Joker. The Joker. And plus, oh. I could buy more video cards so that I have more weight. My my decisions have more weight. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> All right, so let's catch people up. So last week we talked about um, some issues involving systems, like what are our systems for decision making, and we talked about our our quarterly conclaves, our process for doing that. And so this this week we're going to be talking about systems. Like we're continuing the conversation. This is one long conversation. It's just been split up into two, and we're going to be uh, talking about um, managing employees. We're going to be talking about daily operations, about ops and all that stuff. Yeah, let's get going. So like what we started with nothing. We started with no systems. Errors would come in and Ben would see them and he would manually write out a, uh, an alert email. He'd send those out on yeah, Gmail. Uh-huh. And since then we've like, we have systems out the, uh, I can't say it on iTunes. I'm sorry, but we've got lots of systems. So how do we how do we coordinate a bunch of like the three of us are independent workers? We've hired a bunch of independent workers. Like how do we coordinate between those? I think the technical term you were looking for there was wazoo. Wazoo. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. That's definitely wazoo. You know, uh, one of the I, one of the things that was really crazy early on was it accelerated so rapidly. Like I remember in the early, early days when we first started this out and launched it, I was thinking, you know, cause we hadn't, we had jobs, right? Star and I were working for a startup and I was thinking, ah, this would be great. I'll have two income streams, right? Like I'll have my day job and then Honey Badger just be doing its thing on the side. It'd just be a cash machine. It'd be awesome. And then it didn't go that way. Like Then reality struck. Yeah. Then reality struck where like uh, Star and I are sitting there at our day jobs, and all of a sudden, Honey Badger's on fire, and I was like, "Oh, we got to go take a lunch break right now," you know. <laughs> um, and so, like, eventually, they just—it's like the pressure was too much, right? We we couldn't do both, and so we we had to dive in on on Honey Badger. Uh, but a lot of that was because things were just growing so rapidly, and uh, the traffic was coming in, and things were falling apart, and like that one server that we bought initially, right, had to become two, and and so on. But, yeah. And we did not build this thing for scale, people. We did not prematurely optimize. We did not. No, we definitely did not. And and so, you know, a lot of the you know, people joke about the bailing wire and duct tape and the changing the engine while you're going down the road kind of thing. And that's definitely what we were doing. And that was high stress. And over over time, it became uh, just too much. Like I was, I was totally getting burned out. And so I was talking to a friend of mine who also has a startup, not, not exactly the same kind of operational burden that we have, but he had a lot of customers who were um, smaller. And so he was also dealing with some of his own constraints and, and his own pressures for scaling his business. And one of the tips that he gave me was when you do something, document it. Like don't, don't just fix something. Like if you fix something, document what happened, why there was a problem and what you did to solve it. And then if you find yourself like having to deal with that again, automate that. Like, so step one, do it. Step two, document it. Step three, automate it. And when I really got in the groove on that idea, that just changed my world. I got into the point where I was actually like documenting the things I was doing so that if I was away for a day or whatever, uh, you two could like read my documentation and find out where, where, where things were. And, uh, and then as time went on, automated stuff so that you didn't have to care because it was just taken care of. And that was just, that's changed my life. So I just had to throw that out there. Yeah. And we've, we brought that to basically every other part of the business um, as much as possible. Like we're, we're all about documenting everything and automating and anything that can be automated. So 
yeah, it's, it's not just operations at this point. Like we try to do that for whatever is possible, whatever it's possible to do that with. One of the side effects was aside from me being able to like go away for a vacation, which was really nice. One of the other side effects was just feeling more comfortable with where the business was as an entity separate from, from ourselves. Like we mentioned briefly in the last episode about how we wanted the business to be able to operate independently from us so that we could go away. And uh, that can be a short-term thing like a vacation or it could be a long-term thing like when you want to sell the business, right? Or when you Mm -hmm. want to replace yourself with employees. Like in the early days, we couldn't hand anything off to anybody because none of it was documented. It was all in our heads. We were doing all the things that we knew how to do, but nobody else knew how to do them. And over time, as we did document that and automate that, uh, it was much more conceivable for us to actually bring on an employee to do X, Y, and Z because now we had it pretty well planned out. It wouldn't be just a discovery process like, oh, good luck, figure out how to do it. You know, It's kind of interesting to me hearing like the, the documentation and automation story from the operations side. We had, we, we talked about uh, in the last podcast, we talked about the, um, you know, like the, the books about scaling and creating business systems and uh, business systems are basically the same deal. Like most of those books talk about, you know, like you, you document and then you build the systems, which are kind of like usually like checklists or something. And then the automation comes through having, you know, getting other people to do that, do those things. And I think, uh, you know, we've tried to do that to some extent. Um, but as developers, we, we kind of, we try to prefer like, you know, getting computers to do those things or outsource services whenever possible, because we can just, you know, if we can program something to do that, it kind of just fits our, you know, our small lean style better. Oh, totally. So what are some examples of, uh, like we're talking kind of generally, so what are, what are some specific examples of things we've, that we no longer have to do because they were documented and subsequently automated? One of our classic examples, and this might be on the tip of Ben's tongue too, um, but is, uh, and I, we talked about them before is print fiction and how we've automated our, uh, you know, our swag fulfillment. Um, because I don't know about you guys, I got, I was getting really tired of like going out and buying envelopes and folding shirts and putting shirts in envelopes and then, you know, taking the envelopes to the post office to, to mail to people. Um, and now, you know, we, we basically like we had documented how we were doing that. And, and then we found a service that actually like can let us do that through an API, which is kind of like the best thing in the world to me. Can we get like a sponsorship from them? I feel <laughs> we like probably we're should. Really, I feel like we're repping yeah. more than we're repping our own company. Yeah. <laughs> well, here, here's yeah. a, uh, a specific example from our pipeline over the last uh, little while. So we use Elasticsearch for indexing the notice payloads that come into the system so that... Uh, yeah, the notice payloads are like the, the main sort of data in the error that happened, right? Right. Right. And so we index, you know, like where the error happened and who it happened to and all that stuff is in our really big Elasticsearch cluster. And it works great, like 99% of the time. But there are cases where like uh, we might try to submit a batch of of payloads to be indexed by Elasticsearch and it returns an error and that, that whole batch just fails. And our batches typically are like 100 payloads at a time. And there might be a case where uh, you know, Elasticsearch is, you know, taking a little siesta and a few hundred uh, payloads just don't get indexed right away. And so we have a system that uh, kicks information about that particular error into Slack. It's like, oh, okay, Elasticsearch had an issue and these payloads did not get indexed. And when I when I first implemented that system, like that was it. Like it would, it would notify the Slack channel and I'd have to go in there manually and uh, find those, the IDs of those payloads that did not get indexed and go back and, and, and manually tell Elasticsearch, yeah, go index those, those payloads. And that worked fine initially. And then uh, over time though, you're like, you, you don't wanna be doing that all the time. So the next step was, okay, we, we, we know which batches did not get processed. So let's record those batches in a database. In our case, we're using DynamoDB for this. And then when, whenever we detect that some batches fail, like when records show up in that DynamoDB table, we know there was a failure. Uh, we can just use that table to drive Elasticsearch and remind it, hey, please go re-index those payloads, right? So that's where we are today. Uh, so now we don't have to use a Slack channel. Like we can say, okay, we can pull those records in the DynamoDB table. And then the next step in the automation, which I haven't done yet is, okay, well, we know that these things can be re-indexed maybe a few minutes later. So let's just set up an automated you know, process that once it sees a record show up in DynamoDB, 
like it waits five minutes and then tries to re-index and keeps on trying that until it's done, right? So that's that's one yeah. example of something that we've done to like uh, something I do manually. And then we, I, I did document like, how do you actually do this restoration process? And then uh, working on the automation part. You know what this really reminds me of is um, this really reminds me of the whole like lean startup um, approach to like building products for other people where you start with a minimum viable product. And maybe that minimum viable product is like, you responding to some emails in a way that looks like a computer. And then um, based on what you learn from that, then you, you know, slowly automate it and build it into a real uh, product. Only, yeah. you know, you're the the customer and the uh, programmer. Back on the business end, like what about customer service stuff? Because I know that we've had a lot of customer, you know, customer service requests that got pretty repetitive over the years. And a lot of them we've been able to completely eliminate by creating like self-serve tools and, and, you know, things that, that allow customers to help themselves. And sometimes that's, that is like, it's like an actual tool that we build. Sometimes it's actually just putting, you know, writing some extra documentation that answers that question preemptively. And you can kind of look at documentation as, you know, as far as like, you know, customer facing documentation as a uh, kind of as a system in itself. That's a good point. Because when you mentioned uh, customer service, I got this little, um, I got this little lump in my my stomach, because I was like, well, you know, he's going to talk about how we don't really have canned replies for anything. We've talked for a long <laughs> time about having canned replies that that we can sort of just send off to people, but yeah. this haven't hasn't really worked for us very well because we get a lot of questions along the same lines, but they're, you know, they're all very specific, you know? Well, yeah. And, and we don't, yeah, they're, they're, a lot of them are specific, but some of them you could, you know, you could answer them with a, a canned reply. Um, but we really want to help people. Um, I think like the helping people is really important on our support and we don't want, you know, if we can give people a more a specific answer, um, to something or a more like, you know, uh, a creative solution. I think that we, you know, we're not really happy with just the canned reply that we would have for everyone. But what I was saying is that um, that's not the only way you can automate this customer support. You can actually kind of do it um, around the back way by eliminating the reasons why people are contacting you for customer support. And if if you can do that by, um, say, putting a link to the appropriate documentation right next to the thing in your user interface that causes people problems, you can do it that way. Or maybe you can make a tool that automates some, something they're asking you to do manually. Just to be clear, I wasn't I wasn't saying like, you know, we want to be personal. I was saying like, as a developer, like I can spot canned replies from a mile away personally, and they piss me the hell off. <laughs> so, well, I mean, that's as, as cus- you know, as <laughs> since we have developers who are our customers, like I, you know, I want to be able to help them and give them a good, you know, an actual solution versus just like, oh yeah, here's like the, you know, you know that that kind of mentality, like the who we are, who we serve, right? That actually guides a lot of the decisions that we make, like the the help desk system that we use. Like I remember when we first started, and I was looking at the options for what kind of uh, support system we were going to use. There are ones that have this auto reply feature, which is, you know, hey, we've received your request. Your request is number, blah, blah, blah. Uh, we'll get back to you, you know, shortly. And that drives me crazy. I hate that. Like, I hate this automated thing that says, we got your request. And I, yeah. I understand why some people like that. You know, it's like, oh, like, it didn't get lost in the ether, blah, blah, blah. But um, I'd rather just like respond to people like me. You know, <laughs> yeah. uh, so we ended up not choosing one that had that feature because I didn't want that kind of experience for our customer. Yeah, I mean, we to be fair, we do have a couple canned replies, and a couple of them are very extremely useful because there we have a few like highly technical edge cases that um, that you guys you like if you're going to help someone with this issue, you know, you're going to go spend an hour digging on it. You know, JavaScript source maps is is a pretty hairy one that comes to mind, and I have a canned reply for specifically for those types of issues, which like, you know, it's very, it lays out all the, all the different things that they could do to potentially troubleshoot their issue, just because the issues are so, um, there's such a variety of potential, um, solutions to it. And I think that's pretty helpful for, for the rest of you guys who don't really want to have, you know, be experts in, uh, in the, the source map V3 spec (laughs) that is, that's currently published in a Google doc, by the way. And the other thing that we've done, is, you know, regarding the customer service stuff is there are some things that we just have to do on our end to fix things, right? Because sometimes data gets out of whack and there's nothing that the customer can do. It's, it's on us, right? And so we've documented yeah. 
here are the steps that you need to follow when you when someone asks about this particular problem, right? And that's been very yeah. helpful, I think, in, in sharing the load and, and making that more efficient. Yeah, so we use documentation in our support process to like help us provide better support, but we do it with standards, I think is... Yeah. I mean, life would be a little bit easier if, if our customers didn't have such like sensitive bullshit meters. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> like, can we find a, a, a target market that's a little bit more gullible <laughs> next time, maybe? <laughs> yeah. But like, yeah, they're a little more hand wavy. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like uh, I, I can think of, a, I think, a number of cases where um, I think Ben has done a lot of this, but like, yeah, automated a solution or, you know, built something into the app that lets people do a, a process that they were asking us to do before. Um, yeah. Like transferring projects, for instance. Yeah, because a lot of customer support is, or at least for us, is really just sort of like a band aid over something that the app itself is missing, or um, like the user interface is confusing in some way, and so the real you know solution is to fix the user interface. Yeah, yeah, I say like there really we have like two. There's two types of typical support requests, and it's that it's like the you know something's missing that the, they just want to do but they can't in the interface, and then there's super technical, like, you know, like, let me help you debug your app type thing. Um, and, uh, we've, we've tried to get a little better at like saying no in certain cases. Cause in the past we've, we've been, uh, tempted to like, yeah, let's talk about <laughs> this. Let's go into this. This is interesting. You know, like <laughs> jump on a, a screen share or something and like, you know, pair program with them for two hours. I'm exaggerating. We haven't done that, but, but I mean, we, <laughs> we I mean, ben, some, ben might have, <laughs> we figured out some intense, issues for people right what are some of the issues that we've like helped people debug there was that one with rational in the ruby world right well yeah, yeah. that's the um what that was the math the math math, N. math engine right or it's it was a standard lib well the math it, i'm trying to remember so the math n gem or not gem it was a standard library um thing in ruby um, that's not, it's not required, but it's an optional thing though. And if you require this math, if you require math N, and this isn't in Ruby anymore, thank God, because they took it out, I think in like Ruby two, I forget what it was like two five or something. Yeah. Recently, um, because I saw it and I was like <laughs> jumping for joy. Um, if you require this thing, it changes all, uh, decimal numbers to rational numbers or something or it, it changes division division, division gives you returns like <laughs> a rational number instead of yeah instead of instead of like floating point so normally when you divide um you get a number that's like um 1.125 blah 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 repeating but then like a rational number is like a fraction right and like 22 over 7 yeah right? and in ruby it's like an entirely different object it has totally different you know properties of you know how it interacts and like what it converts to and and it blew up our gym it just yeah but it blew it up in such an obscure like just like very subtle way um and this was back when we were doing a uh, metrics collection by the way i think it was in the metrics uh, service where we were doing some like statistical calculations and it was like, it wasn't in a way where it was like an, an error. It was like one of those errors where it's like, it's not an exception. It's not blowing anything up, but it's giving you the wrong value. And you just cannot figure out like why you would be getting this value back because it, it's like, there's no rational explanation. <laughs> um, pun, pun intended. <laughs> Yeah, and I remember we've had some other cases where people include gems that redefine certain standard library methods. Yeah, and then yeah, monkey patching because that that's basically what the what Math N was doing is monkey patching in Ruby is where they're basically rewriting you know rewriting things dynamically at runtime, and it's incredibly difficult to find where those things are unless you're familiar with the application. And in in a lot of cases, like we've actually you know like stepped through that thing and you know that process in people's apps. Um, which I think is uh, well beyond what most companies are willing to do. So these people are paying us like maybe as low as $50 a month. I, I was going to say like, I've never had such a low hourly rate. <laughs> <laughs> so $50 a month and we're like, you know, sometimes spending hours on, yeah. on customer service. So that's, that's something we're trying to get, get a yeah. little bit better at and sort of say, we have, <laughs> because just frank, yeah, we yeah we've it. gotten, we've gotten better at that. And, and like I said, like, as we, as we've, I think it's it's helped us to some extent, though, that we did get in deep into those issues for a time, um, because it's helped us uh, build much more comprehensive and deep like documentation about um, the types of issues that people can run into. Um, it's not you know it's not really our fault. It's just 
it's just programming. Like you're going to run into issues with things. So yeah, we know, we kind of know what to expect and, and then we can build that into our documentation now instead of like sitting down and and spending a bunch of time on it, hopefully. Totally, because like the number of issues that can come up, especially in Ruby, where like somebody can redefine the language out from <laughs> underneath you. Yeah. Like you, there's, you can't depend on anything in Ruby, and uh, and that's cool in some in some cases, but also it's you know if you're trying to provide a library for somebody to use, it always works. It can be a little bit frustrating. Well, one of the uh, things you know, talking about things blowing up underneath you, you know that that we've done more recently is our uh, continuous deployment setup. Like, you know, for a long time, we've done continuous integration, right? Where we have, we have a big set of uh, tests that we run for our code. And, and Josh is really good about keeping on me in particular about making sure that I write new tests when I write new code. Uh, and so we have this big test suite that gets run, you know, uh, whenever you want on, on your machine, but also gets run automatically for every check-in, every push. Yeah, so every time you add new code and you share that code, it gets tested. And so we find out in Slack if, you know, I broke the build or whatever. Uh, but uh, for the longest time, we just manually deployed uh, using Capistrano. It worked just fine. And not even just Capistrano. This is Capistrano oh, yeah. two point like the previous like a version of Capistrano that stopped being developed like it four years like, ago. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. You know. Um, yeah. But recently, we decided we we brought on you know a new developer hire, and we thought you know maybe it's time to make this process a little more automated so that it's a little more hands off. And so now we have Circle CI. We're using the the continuous deployment feature, you know, function where we can actually have it trigger jobs that actually do the deployment for us. And that's that's been really nice to see that code, you know, shows up when it's supposed to. And we're not like wondering, oh, did it, did it get there? Or, you know, can I deploy this stuff? Is it safe? Like sometimes since we are siloed and how we do our development, sometimes it's like, oh, did you really want that to go to production yet? Or, you know, is it still waiting? No, we had like a some sort of issue too, where like something was... Uh... Yeah. It was the asset compilation in Rails. It was... It would, it would like get compiled yeah. on one of our web servers, but not on the other. And so then there would be some inconsistent results. You know, when you were browsing the site, you, the CSS would be missing or the JavaScript would be missing. So, you know, just having, yeah. so as part of that continuous distribution, we have the assets pushed out, you know, uh, automatically by circle and that really smoothed that over. Yeah. So it turns out deploying like applications on multiple servers and having them all be like in sync all the time isn't always super trivial. This was, this was actually a, uh, you're talking about having things change out from under you. This is actually exactly that. Like you upgraded Webpacker, right? Because we we're you know trying to keep up current with our dependencies, and the behavior changed mm -hmm. from the version we were using to the version that we upgraded to. And the behavior change was that those asset file names, when it compiles the assets, they changed based on the path. And when you're deploying to two different servers. And we use time-stamped uh, deployment directories like Capistrano does. Well, one server may have been one second ahead of the other server. And so now they had different path names. And now those assets, <laughs> when they got compiled, had different names in their file names. Oh, interesting. Uh, hmm. Doing the continuous deployment thing made that more consistent. And I went and found the little <laughs> behavior change in Webpacker after like hours of pulling my hair out trying to figure out what was going on. And yeah, brought, made that consistent again and that that solved that problem but having that continuous deployment uh helped <laughs> pave over those the, that weirdness well i didn't know that ben thank you thank you for, thank you for your service i've been loving the the continuous deployment by the way that oh, um yeah. it's, oh me too i mean it seems like it's a small thing like you can just run cap deploy or whatever but it's you know it really those little automations seem to add up over time Definitely. um yeah, it seems to add up to a lot of time saved. I don't know about you guys, but when I deploy manually, I can't help but just like stare at the <laughs> output as it deploys. And I don't know what I'm expecting to find. I'm not going to like jump in and fix something yeah. if it goes wrong. It's like, I just can't not just like Well, sit I think there. that the environments, like having it in this, always in the same environment, deploy from the same environment helps because it's more like, you're not thinking like, you know, this is running on my laptop. There's a number, like a bunch of things that could cause this to fail. And I literally need to sit here and watch this to make sure it doesn't blow up. Right. At least that's, that's like, for me, I, I find myself doing the same thing, uh, star. And I think usually it's like, I'm sitting there cause I'm not quite convinced that it's actually going to work. And, and it's helped scale the business, right? Because the, the, the precipitating event for this was hiring Kevin and like, oh, well, Kevin has to be able to deploy now. Well, do we 
tell Kevin, well, cap deploy whenever you want, or do we just say yeah. Plus VPNs and all that stuff? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Or do we just say, just push it to master and circle take care of it for you, right? That's much easier, yeah. much more scalable on, on the people sense. Yeah. And it helps us enforce our rules around master. So right. it's, if you, if you commit directly to master, it's definitely going out. It's going to production. <laughs> Ship it. Oh wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> so you have you been force pushing a master star? <laughs> That's I just made a a, a batch of latest. It just force pushes everything. Like I just <laughs> right. I just type in get push and it just automatically force pushes to master. Oh good. Okay. Cool. You, you know what? Confession time though. My favorite commit message. <laughs> my favorite yeah. commit message that I make is oops. Like. <laughs> uh, when I commit that thing to master and like things break and I'm like, oops. And so I commit the fix. <laughs> there it is. Oops. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We can do this because we're the bosses. So <laughs> all you DevOps or all you ops people out there who are like pulling your hair out. Well, um, yeah, too bad. So, you know, one thing that's changed though recently, and this was, yeah. this came up during the, the interview process when I was uh, talking to developers was, you know, we, we talked in our previous episode about how we work pretty independently. Like the three of us, we, pick things we want to work on and then we go work on that thing until it's done and then we do the next thing, right? And so a lot, the question I got a lot of times was, well, how is that going to work when you have a developer who's not one of you three, right? Who doesn't share your brain space. And so that's, that's been a little bit of a change in the business. Uh, so I guess we could talk a little bit about how we've you know, transitioned into, into that new reality. Yeah, how, how does that work? Well, I think having the the conclaves on a quarterly basis definitely helps. You know, setting the vision for what we want to have happen over the next few months definitely gives us, uh, well, gives me anyway, some some talking points and some context that I can share with like Kevin, and I can say, here are the things that we want to accomplish. Like, here are the goals that we have for the next you know, year or the next half year, and here compare that to the list of issues that we have in GitHub you know, enhancement requests and, uh, you know, bugs and things like that. So, you know, go wild, <laughs> go in there, figure out like what makes sense, like what you feel has impact to get us to where we want to go, to get us to you know, make some progress on the goals that we set out in the conclave. And that's been really helpful. Like, cause you know, I definitely don't want to be, uh, in a situation where there's micromanaging happening. Like I don't want to tell someone what to do every day. And that person I'm sure doesn't want to be told what to do every day. Yeah, we kind of hired for this too. We we yeah. hired for somebody who could work fairly independently. Right. And and to be able to do that though, that person has to have some context, right? Some yeah, some framework yeah. from which they can make decisions about what am I going to work on today? And uh, so I think the having the conclaves has been really helpful for that. Yeah. Oh, totally. Yeah, and we uh I think actually maybe doing the podcast has also been a little bit helpful too because I know some of the uh, I know uh Kevin and and Ben F have been uh, have mentioned that they had listened to some episodes, so yeah, they can kind of get the inside scoop of what's in our heads. Yeah. So how do we? Um, so now that we um, are like bosses, like what? What? I'm not really involved in the bossing. Um, I don't do much bossing myself. Um, I think Ben is like the big boss here <laughs> for most of the time. So what? Like, how yeah. do you do this? How do you? Um, like, how do you manage these these uh, good folks and make sure that you know everybody's happy and and doing what they should be doing and stuff? Uh, yeah, what we what we do is we have we do have a, a monthly one on one. So I I meet with Ben F and uh, and with Kevin monthly via Zoom. We chat about uh, what happened the previous month, the things that they were able to accomplish. Uh, we chat about the things that they want to accomplish in the next month. It's it's really driven by them. I try not to set the agenda except for they know that I'm going to ask about things that happened before and I'm going to ask about what they want to do next. Uh, but after that, it's really up to them to discuss like, how are they feeling? How do they like, you know, being a honey badger uh, and what kind of things they want to work on and maybe what longer term goals they have, things they want to learn, maybe what skills they want to develop. And, you know, for us, I think we've built a business around having fun, learning stuff and, you know, building cool things and serving our customers well. And we want to have that same culture with all of our employees as well. We want them to have fun. We want them to learn new things. We want them to join us in serving our customers well. And hopefully that'll be you know, engaging for everybody. And, and so far, it's worked out really well. We don't want to have sort of a separate track for um, employees. Like we want yeah. to be one company that acts in one way. Yeah, we talked about kind of all wanting to be peers. Would you say we're a flat organization? 
Yeah, I would say yeah, exactly. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna write a book about this now. <laughs> you know, I've I've always avoided the the corporate work environment where there's a lot of just crud you have to deal with. You know, I've avoided working for big companies. Uh, I've avoided working for really cruddy bosses. Uh, and so, it, actually, obviously, I don't want to make my own business into that kind of cruddy environment. It'd be funny if we did though, where if everyone has a has a direct report and <laughs> we are, you know, Ben's Ben's like Ben, you can be the big boss, and then yeah. No, I think it we'll needs to be circular <laughs> where Ben then reports to the lowest person on the totem pole. Oh, okay. Oh, that would be interesting to see where the comp- see where the business goes and with that sort of management structure. Yeah, I mean it's a wheel, so I'm guessing it's going places. <laughs> <laughs> but it has it's it has its benefits for sure, but it has its own challenges as well. Uh, and you know we're still learning. We're trying to figure this out. And you know both Ben F and Kevin have to be flexible, right? And have to be willing to, I guess, step a little bit into the dark because you know they are basically trotting the path for the first time. And and hopefully, and they have been very patient with us and in, in the mistakes that we make and dealing with them. And they've been very good about like taking the initiative and not having to be directed in everything they do, and realizing that hey, yeah, we're just three guys who are trying to figure this out. Yeah. I really mm-hmm. enjoyed working with them. I'm glad we brought them on board. So what's yeah. up next? Like what's our what what do we want to do in terms of systems and automation? Like what's what's going to take our business to the stratosphere? Yeah, what's you're you're asking us like what's your next your next thing to hype, right? Because you you want to be the hype man. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm going to be <laughs> the worst hype man. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah, a little more. You know, we're not we're not at the four hour work week yet. Yeah, right. No. So I, I guess we have some more automation to do, or maybe some more people to hire or something to get to that point. Uh, yeah, but yeah, I think definitely continuing to automate stuff is a is a good way to go. We've talked about we've been what we talked about uh, recently, like ways that we could more like streamline our content production process, and uh, mm-hmm. I think there's something there. You know that. Um, so right now, I mean, we've all been a lot better at producing content, and I think that's really awesome. And now that we actually, you know, we're actually doing stuff now, um, that's always a good opportunity to start documenting and then and then automating or streamlining it. So also, um, for example, like outsourcing um, is a good, you know, we can do more yeah. more of that and and sort of moving things into managed services. Like for example, we used to host all of, all of our um, our own blog content and stuff like that um, using you know Jekyll or whatever static site generator, and uh, now we started using Netlify for all that, and we have four or five websites on Netlify, and we just don't have to do any of the stuff around managing you know, the hosting for them anymore. And that's great. Mm-hmm. Like I'm, I'm very excited about, um, you know, whatever we can put on the managed services, even if it costs us twice as much, like I'm all for, yeah. Like, ben totally. occasionally like teases me with, <laughs> um, it's like, we're going to put our, um, Postgres into a managed Postgres service. <laughs> That'll and be the day. My heart just starts beating. And then it, <laughs> you know, there's, there's always good reasons why we don't quite do it yet, but you know, one day maybe yeah. we'll get there. Get there. Yeah, I, I've definitely had the had to learn how to give up that control, that sense of control over the things that we're running, right? Because I'm I'm the ops person. I like to make sure that things are my way. And uh, yeah, but yeah, we're making progress. Like Star, you've you've convinced me that there are many things that I don't have to control. I don't have to run myself. Like that Elasticsearch cluster I was talking about. Like we don't run that. Like that's a hosted by Amazon kind of thing. Yes. Yeah, yeah we use that. We, it's beautiful. It makes me weep. Like I can upgrade versions. All I gotta do is click a button, <laughs> and I'm, I'm like, "Thank yeah. you, Star." As I click the button, really, you are? Yes. yes I right. don't think. I don't know. I don't think I was like that <laughs> instrumental. But you know, if you want to give me credit, I'll take it. <laughs> um, it's going on my resume. There you go. <laughs> well, you know, like we could circle this all back around to, uh, you know, to like the the business, you know, business advice. Um, but giving up control is a central theme in all of this like systems, you know, business systems stuff too. Like that's the classic, like small business owners problem of like, you have to give up control. You have to be willing to like, let yourself take yourself out of the picture um, and let someone else run the show. um, If you're going to be able to like take yourself out of the picture and like go on vacation or, you know, or sell your business someday, like chances are you're not going to be too happy if you, the only way you can sell your business is if the, you go with it and work for it for the rest of your life. So you have yeah, to kind of step back. Yeah. The whole point of systems is that they allow people who aren't you to do things, right? 
Right. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yep. And yeah, speaking of, so, oh, also one other thing, I, one other system I'm thinking about maybe uh, uh, invoking is getting somebody to edit this damn podcast because that took me a long time. <laughs> yeah, totally. But I, I'm a little worried they won't be able to like bring the sass and make Well, that's the thing. Edit. You're like, you're doing so. such a good job, uh, you know, with it and you have such specialized knowledge about it that, you know, that's, you'll never, you'll probably never find someone to take over for you, Star. That's the eternal struggle. I, I, I can feel it better I mean, myself. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. being kind of facetious there, but <laughs> I think I may. Yeah. There, there may be like a. There may be a. Uh, there may be a, a middle ground where it's like I can go in and do a couple of like big edits. Yeah. You know, things how I want them, and then just be like, okay, you go, you go take out the uhs and ahs and and make a sound beautiful. Sure. Yeah. Well, I think like having like you're. you're do, you're building up a pretty good library of examples of like what we want the show to sound like, right? Like that's part of what you're doing um, by doing it yourself right now. So when yeah. we find the right person to be the editor, we can say, you know, go listen to our, you know, our huge back catalog <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and see what it should sound like and then make it sound like that. You know, this, this is a, a topic that I see come up again and again when it comes to like outsourcing things and, and doing systems is that, you know, when it comes to having some sort of creative element in the process is like, you really have to give people the um, autonomy to, for example, like I do sometimes I just delete whole chunks of things that we say because I, they run on or whatever. They're not, they don't really make the, the podcast sort of flow as well as I'd like it. And it's like, you got to really give people control over that stuff and really, find people who will take advantage of that, con that control and actually do it. Yeah. Um, so you do, you do make me sound really, really smart star. And I appreciate that. And I do that. I worry, I worry that if we have someone else come in that doesn't know what to cut <laughs> and what to leave in that, you know, everyone's going to find out what we really, you know, what we really, we really here's, think. <laughs> here's the thing, Josh, here's the thing. I didn't, I don't make you sound smart. It's like, that's just how you sound. Oh, <laughs> I'm just going to be, yeah, you, you were wearing your, your Ruby slippers this whole time, Josh. <laughs> well, thanks. Thank you, Star. I love that we can end the show on such a nice, positive note. This wraps up our special two-part episode on systems. Next week, Ben and Josh will be back from RailsConf, so we'll be doing our normal thing. And until then, why not head over to uh, iTunes? Give us one of those five-star reviews. We'll take it. Head over to Twitter. Join the conversation. We're at FounderQuest. We'd love to hear your questions, comments, you know, whatever. Just, you know, be nice, be supportive, uh, be loving. And we'll uh, catch you next time. Thanks. ThunderQuest is a weekly podcast by the founders of Honey Badger. Zero instrumentation, 360-degree coverage of errors, outages, and service degradations for your web apps. If you have a web app, you need it. Available at honeybadger.io. Want more from the founders? Go to founderquestpodcast.com. That's one word. You can access our huge back catalog or sign up for our newsletter to get exclusive VIP content. FounderQuest is available on iTunes, Spotify, and other purveyors of fine podcasts. We'll see you next week.